Hey everyone, this is Tommy from the Ravens Creek Study. We're opening a new series. I'm stoked about it. Hopefully you are too. For those of you who came across my uh, series on Christian Theology 101, this should be exciting. Most of you probably did. Systematic Theology 1, we're starting it today. Uh, you can see it's prolegomena, which is just a fancy word for the introduction uh, or the, the foreword if you've read a book and it has like a foreword or a prologue or something like that before it gets into the meat and the heart of everything. This is what we go through, uh, the defining terms like, well, what exactly is theology? Uh, how do we study it? Uh, what, what exactly are we doing when we, quote, do theology? You know, those are some of the basic questions that we wrestle with. And so we have four questions here to kind of start off the series. Uh, why am I doing this? And why are you listening? Uh, first, that, that question of why am I doing this? There, there's two questions here, right? Um, why am I spending so much time and effort in theology, and why am I <laughs> spending... So there's like that personal, and then why why, why me over somebody else? Um, personally, this is something that I've inter been interested in, and it's something that I, I got into just because I wanted to better understand what people are talking about sometimes. Uh, it's something that I got into because I wanted to better understand the Bible. Uh, these are the main reasons that I think everybody really really wrestles with. Uh, when they when they want to study theology, they say, well, I want to know God better. I want to know the Bible better. I want to know theology generally because there are these terms that people use that I have no idea what they're talking about. And so that's kind of where I started. And as I continued to wrestle and as I continued to seek, um, I started to feel like there were things that weren't being addressed or if they were being addressed, they were being poorly addressed. Things started to kind of fall into that realm of it's an endless debate with no real solid answers, uh, and that's not everything, but there were, there were enough things that started to come up for me that I started to ask the question of, well, what can I start putting forth my own thoughts into the discussion? And so that's really where it, it fell for me. Um, that, that second question of, why are you listening? In case you uh, haven't noticed, a lot of the stuff that uh, I put out on on this channel, it starts with notes. Uh, sometimes those notes are like just writing out notes for for uh, your college course or your high school course or whatever. And other times, it's it's actually I've written this out, uh, and in in some cases I've even published it. Uh, that's what's going on here as well. Is that I've written I've written these thoughts out. I'm planning on publishing it uh, in case you're interested anyway. But why are you listening? Why is it that you're you're interested in this? Uh, I'm looking for that, and here it is. Okay. <laughs> so these two questions are something that you'd have to answer yourself. Um, why are you listening to a playlist on YouTube of systematic theology? That's the first question, right? And second, why are you listening to my playlist? So I guess I guess the first one is probably you're you're in the same boat that I was. You're just interested in well, what what is it that's out there? What what is it? How do I understand the Bible better? How do I understand God better? How do I understand these theology terms? And you don't want to go and pay thousands of dollars to be in school for it when you have a few resources online. Um, at least that's what drew me. So let's go ahead and start this then. One of the reasons that I, I decided that I wanted to start putting this out there. Intellect and immaturity. Uh, what I've found, much of what I've found, has revolved around these two things. What The sources that I've, I've found on YouTube, the free sources online, uh, the, the Bible colleges that you can find on like iTunes U, a lot of it, it, it revolves around intellect and immaturity. And even some of the theology books that I have that I read, um, there's much headiness in the way things are reasoned out, and there's a, a lot of uh, intelligent discussion, sometimes more than discussion, it's debate and it's arguing. It's kind of childish in the way that they do it. But there's a lot of headiness there, but there's not a whole lot of heart issue. It doesn't seem to connect the head to the heart. It's just, this is what we believe, and it's dry as dry could be. And the the immaturity, it's the way things are handled. That's part of that heart thing, right? Um, we're talking about God. It's not some random subject that we can twist and contort in hopes to make it fit into our explanations. It's not something that we can just say, well, this here, we're talking about salvation today, and here's the doctrine of salvation, and just kind of cut and dry, 
uh, copy and paste what you've heard others say and put it all together. That, that's not really the way we should be handling this subject matter. After all, if we're talking about salvation, you and I are claiming that we are in Christ, who we have had this experience. This is something that should be joyous. We should be able to have that kind of uh, that kind of explanation in a way that that's very much connected to the heart. It's not just a, a very dry mechanical statement of this is salvation. But then there's another side where it's not it's not just that it's I guess it's the opposite of that that uh, copy and paste that very dry explanation where the heart is so involved that there's no the, there's no real explanation on things because you get so caught captured in, in in this euphoria and I've seen it both ways um, and so I mean we, we need the we need the connection and we need it we need it to be both there and expressed very maturely uh, much of theology what I've found this is, again is, is part of that immaturity much of theology's response so you have um, you have in the early church writers a lot of the things they were writing and, and, and speaking, it was a response to Judaism. This is why we are no longer Jewish. We're now following Christ. We're Christians. Um, later on, there would be this response to Catholicism, this response to the Anabaptists, this response to Wesleyanism versus Calvinism versus Open Theism versus, you know, all, versus the Greek Orthodox. I mean, all of these, it, it's response theology. It's here's why we believe this, because we're not that. Or even the discussions that we go down, um, transubstantiation, whether we eat the, the bread and wine and that turns into the body and blood of Christ, that's a discussion that you would never find from just reading the Bible and putting it out there as to well, this is what the Bible says. That kind of discussion, that kind of argument comes strictly from responding to Catholicism or defending Catholicism. That's not something that you find just because you read your Bible enough times that there it is. Um, these kinds of arguments, these kind of kinds of debates, this is what I'm talking about with intellect and immaturity. There's a lot that goes into it, and it's not all bad, but it, it is it is kind of haphazard sometimes. So the the theology is the study of God, just putting it out there as a very baseline. We'll get into a better definition later, but. Um, theology comes from theos and logos. It's the discourse on God or study of God. And if we can't even do that, then we're only pretending to be mature and deep in the faith. If, if the whole point is not to study God, but to put forth our own ideas and our own defenses and apologetics for why we believe this as opposed to that, if that's all we're doing, then it's not actually theology. Something terrible happens when we develop a theology via the concordance. And so we're trying to defend why we believe this, and so we, we go to the concordance to find all the scriptures that we can that, that talk about such and such subject. And we then say, ah, you see, here's the answer. But, I mean, even worse is the compilation of teachings through the centuries before us, that we don't even, we don't even go to the concordance to, like, come to our own conclusions. We just find the others who have already done that, and then we compile their teachings and say, you see, I'm in good company here. And that's exactly what happens in many cases, sadly. Um, our theology should never rest upon a coalescence of church history and scripture. It should always rest upon the revelation of God. God has indeed revealed himself to you. If you are in the faith, if you are in Christ, if you are a part of the, the story of God, what God is doing in our midst, if you know him, then he has shown himself to you, and you have that revelation, you have that understanding, because God has made it evident to you, here is what you have to say. That should really be the ground and basis by which we speak. It should not be, we've studied and become scholars, which, by the way, I'm not. But, that that's my point exactly, though. Uh, systematic theology, from an apostolic and prophetic perspective, what I'm after here uh, in my in this whole series is to try to put forth a systematic theology from an apostolic and prophetic perspective. Now, what does that mean? The, the apostolic and prophetic perspectives, when, what makes you apostolic or prophetic? It's a zealous or maybe even a jealous zeal for the uh, glory of God forever. Not just the glory of God, not just benefit, not just that he would have a glory in what we write, but that there would be that forever, that 
the consummation of the age, the establishment of the throne, that all nations see his glory, all nations are now at peace and at rest, that, that final fulfillment that all of the apostles, all of the prophets wrote about. It's that perspective, perspective of the eternality and the weightiness of everything. That's what, that's what I really want to invest in. If we discuss theology and we say, okay, what are our sources for theology, for studying theology? Is there a question that can be asked that would then get at the heart of sources of theology in relation to the eternal perspective? That we are not considering it just for the sake of having our own theology, but it really rests in wanting to know Jesus and wanting to know God and, and wanting to have that better understanding that, that sends us to that um, apostolic and prophetic perspective so that when we read the scriptures, we're reading it in the context of what they were actually writing, and we're not just looking for our own viewpoint or our own mindset or to confirm what we've believed or to disprove what we've believed, and now we have to go this way instead. The idea is to be brought again into that um, Hebrew perspective, if you will, that from the beginning to the end, all of the saints who have written in our canon of scripture, they seem to have that same heart, that same mindset, that same uh, perception, and they all build upon one another. What is it that that is? And that really should be what we're doing. And that's not to say, thus saith the Lord, before we even enter the discussion. This is a humble, me putting forth my own thoughts here and saying, let's start the discussion. I haven't seen too many others, if any, who would try to start this in a theology. Um, there have been others who have, who have made the statement, but here I want to try to actually build it. So, response theology versus theology. Um, like I said before, much of theology is rooted in responding to Catholicism and opposing denominations. So if you're, if you are um, First Baptist Church on such and such road in your town, there are a lot of things that you're not. You're not the Nazarenes, you're not the Methodists, you're not the um, Charismatic or Pentecostal or Assemblies of God or whatever denomination would fall into that that might be in the same town. You're not the Catholics that fall into the same town. Uh, you're not the Messianic Jews or whatever other denominations, right? So the question then is, what makes you different? And that's really where most people have built their theology. I've already said this, and I don't want to repeat myself too much here. But I want, but I want to put this forth and say I want to bypass as much of that kind of argument as possible in this whole series and ask, what does the Bible say? So a fad in modern times is to get back to the first century belief. Uh, whether, whether, like I said, it's Messianic Judaism or it's that um, Acts 29 church or whatever kind of denomination they've put it into, it's, it's the idea of going back to the first century and trying to be more communal. And they look at Acts chapter 2 and say, this is how they did it. And then they systematize, this is how they did it. But even the first century apostles and Jesus taught from the Old Testament, rooting every statement in the Old Testament concept. So it's not like first century church is somehow a new thing. It goes back to Deuteronomy, to what God had told them in Deuteronomy, in Leviticus, in Genesis, that from the very beginning all the way through, when we had the establishment of, of the, the religion that God has put forth in Israel, I mean, I don't even want to call it religion, but when, when God had spoken and said, this is the way that you do things, that's the way that it was rooted in the book of Acts. That's, the, that's what they went back to. It's not like this is a new establishment. The very logic of the Spirit being poured out upon them, it caused for them to live in this way. It wasn't about a matter of, now we figured out this is the way God wants it actually, and so we're going to do that instead. It was, the Spirit gives utterance. And it was in utterance in Genesis, Leviticus, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and it's in, it's in the same teachings of Jesus and the Apostles. All of it comes together. It's all rooted together. God is after one thing. It's an eternally set thing. It hasn't changed. So apostolic, prophetic versus apostate and pathetic. Um, theology should be a rediscovery of our roots, of our God, and of our worldview. To debate the hypostatic union and transubstantiation and sovereignty and free will and all of these other eight great debates of our modern time, creation and evolution, 
to debate these things, it really just misses the mark. It, it kind of bypasses what theology really should be and kind of puts it into a completely different area. And I mean, some of that is apologetics, and some of that's necessary. Some of that, but we shouldn't call apologetics theology. You know, while while some of this has grand place in theology, that grandeur is not the forefront. That when when we're debating something like the hypostatic union, that that Jesus was fully man and fully God. Yeah, there's a lot that should be said there, and we should defend it. But there's there's a lot that that is not the basis of understanding Jesus as Messiah or understanding of the second part of the Trinity. It goes before Jesus comes into the scene as, as born of a virgin and as fully God, fully man. Jesus existed before that, and if we can't understand the concept of Messiah from the very foundations forward, then we're not really understanding what happened in the New Testament, in, in the Gospels with, with the birth of Christ. We're not understanding what's being conveyed here. And so really what I want to point out here is instead of trying to debate these doctrines and saying this is important, yeah, it's important, but let's let's debate the whole scripture. Let's understand the whole context of why that doctrine is important. You get what I'm you get what I'm getting at here? Theology is not is about coming to know God, and not to nearly know about God. It, it's 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 supposed to be a discovery deeper and deeper and deeper understanding of who God is. And this God that we worship and, and coming to love him more and more. It's not about knowing what he said simply because we love him. It, it's about coming to know him. Hebrew and Greek. Um, in the second century and onward, uh, concepts completely foreign to the Bible entered theology. Now this is something that I know is controversial, uh, but it seems to be right to me. Greek philosophy and the mindset of the Greeks was completely different than Hebrew. And when you have a bunch of Hellenized Gentiles coming into the faith, they're looking at their Greek philosophers and their Greek mindset, and they're trying to read the Old Testament, they're trying to read the, the epistles uh, and the gospels and all of the things that the apostles had wrote and, written and handed to them. And they're trying to make sense of it through the, that Greek mindset, but they're not looking at it from the way, the perspective that the prophetic and apostolic men would have actually had and written. So there are similarities in language sometimes. Um, Paul and Peter both talk about marriage and women, and some of the things that they say, we can read from that Greek mindset and say, ah, you see, there's this that says women shouldn't speak in church. We see that it says that, you know, uh, husbands are to rule over the wife. They're the head of the household. But that's not what Peter or Paul said because they're not using the same language as Aristotle and Gal Galileo and the other philosophers. They're on purpose using different Greek words to try to convey something completely different than what the Greek philosophers were saying. But on, th and this is the easy one to hit. But because we have so developed our own worldview and mindset and culture through the Greek Hellenized world. When we come to the Bible, we can see it and say, ah, you see, it says that the man is the head of the wife, and therefore we can continue with what Aristotle has taught us. But that's not the way that this works. We need to understand what is it that Paul was saying, and not simply was Paul agreeing with them, and if so, then great, we'll just continue going with them. With the Reformation, Luther and Calvin reformed what existed. I think much of Christianity Christianity today, in theology and in church practice, they reflect the Catholic standard, even if being different in some very key ways. I mean, th theologically, Luther and Calvin broke from, from Catholicism because of a lot of significant and very horrible things that the Catholics were doing. Um, one of the big things that we all know about is indulgences, right? And Luther could not stand that the Catholics would charge people money to try to get their loved ones into heaven and you have to buy these indulgences to, to be able to get your loved ones to heaven or to, to save your, your child from dying and going to hell or whatever, you know? And it was a huge money maker. But the problem is, because all that was really reformed was like certain aspects of the theology, when we look at today, we can... 
I can see that there are a lot of things where we are reverting back into that Catholicism and that Catholic standard, even though we all the while are saying we're completely different than them. But because we took what already existed and we reshaped it, a different word for reformed it, we didn't actually break away to finding the faith that was once and for all what has been given from the foundations of the world. The Bible is framework. If we want to bypass the arguments, whether introduced by Greek philosophy or Catholicism, then we, meet, we need to know what exactly are we for. It's not a matter of knowing what we are against and why we're against it. What are we for? Building a theology that is against everything will tell us what we do believe to a degree, but it won't give us an answer to the question behind the question of why. And we can point to scriptures and say, there's my proof text, but that doesn't really get to the heart of it in, ask, in answering that question of why. It doesn't build from the very beginnings. This is the way God has always worked. It just gives us that, that text like, well, it says it here. So if there's no scriptural witness on something, such as the arguments for God's existence, or whether abstract objects exist, you know, is there a thing called love and it's an abstract object somewhere in the universe, or multiverse, or whatever, there's an abstract object somewhere that is love, and when we feel love, we are having a connection with that abstract object. Is that how it works, or is there some... Look, that's not even in the Bible anywhere. Why would we discuss it? Even though Augustine did discuss it, and he said, well, they do exist, but they're in the mind of God. Let's just go ahead and completely bypass all of that, because it's not in the Scripture. That's not theology. Again, it might be apologetics, which has its place, but, that, but apologetics is not theology. Let's not waste our mind or our energy on these trivial things. Apostolic and prophetic witness. 1 Corinthians 14.32 says, The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, and the context is prophecy. Now, <laughs> go back and read 1 Corinthians 14. You'll, you'll recognize the discussion starts back in chapter 12 with tongues. And, of course, it's not just tongues, but that's the main thrust of chapter 12. It's the spiritual gifts. He gives the whole list of it, and then he goes into the, this operating in tongues. And then um, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, it starts with tongues. And the whole point that he's making is that it doesn't matter what gift you're operating in. If you don't have love, then none of them really are beneficial in any way. And then you go straight from that into chapter 14, and he's talking about tongues again, but he's also talking about prophecy some. If we believe the Bible is prophetic and apostolic in its nature, that is to say, if we believe that the prophets and apostles wrote this word, then we must also be prophetic and apostolic in our learning and teaching of it. That's not to say we must be prof prophets and apostles. It's to say that mindset, the way they perceive, the, the, the way in which they reason, the Whole, that whole system by which they understood and saw the world, that eternal perspective. We should, we should be able to, to have that same kind of perspective and to be able to give the words because we ourselves have been taught by the prophets and apostles. The apostles and prophets interpret the apostles and prophets. Evangelists herald the message, pastors shepherds the flock, teach, teach the people. It all stems from the foundations that the apostles and prophets interpret the apostles and prophets. And whenever you go to, whether it's Isaiah or Ezekiel or the New Testament with, with Paul or Peter or John or the book of James or the Gospels or whatever, you always find what they are doing is they're building upon what was already said. They're building upon what was already spoken. Everyone, David in the Psalms, he goes back to what Moses has taught and he building upon it in his psalms. Everything builds upon the other prophets and apostles. While anyone can and should do theology, and even do, a, do good theology, teach, teach solid things, it's my contention that we need to build from the foundations and not from our fathers. What I mean by that, while it's important that we can understand some of where we came from, it is, not, it is not so important that we know what Augustine taught, that we can build our theology because Augustine said such and such, and Thomas Aquinas took it and went further with it here, and then we found that Calvin picked that up again and went further. 
that doesn't really matter so much because the question is what did what did Jesus say? What did what do the prophets tell us? What did Moses say? What did God say through them specifically, right? That's really where it matters. It's not so much as to our interpretation, it's to what they actually said. And our interpretation should obviously be building upon what they said, but sometimes it's a very clear statement that they make and we want to interpret it away. It isn't that pastors and teachers cannot expound the scriptures, but that if we're only repeating what we've been taught by those who are smarter than we are, then we have left the basis of faith and we have left true sources in process of authentic theology. If it's a matter of saying, look, all of these people agree with me, and we can trace our roots through our, our forefathers and say, see, I'm in good company here, that's not the same as being able to say, I've wrestled with this, and after wrestling with God and with man, <laughs> I've come through to, these, to this understanding. It's not the same. In a day when the loudest voices are false, uh, specifically apostolic and prophetic voices, there's that new apostolic reformation. When the loudest voices are false, it takes real gumption to stand up and to claim to be apostolic or prophetic, and at the same time to be intellectual, especially since they hate intelligence. Um, everything should be by faith, everything should be by the Spirit. Um, and yet this is exactly what I'm I'm doing and I'm suggesting that we all should be doing. I want these teachings to communicate the divine, the heavenly perspective. I want, I want the whole point of, of any systematic theology, any view that we have, to be tapping into what is it that God actually sees? What is it that God actually says, believes, has faith towards? What is it that God is saying instead of how is it that we've understood it? Western Christianity has countless sources of teaching Bibles, books, and colleges, and seminaries, and the list can go on and on, podcasts and everything else. Why, with all of this opportunity, much of it being free, why, with all of this opportunity, are we lacking in maturity and understanding? Why is it that there are still so many people who are saying, I want to find these sources of theology so I can better understand the Bible? Do you have a Bible? Are you reading your Bible? Why is it that there's a lack here, then? What is it that's causing us to not be able to understand? Where's, where is the um, broken connection so that the, the electronics can't communicate? Good teaching and opportunity, even willingness, is not where maturity, fullness, and understanding are obtained. It's not through our much teaching. It's not through our opportunity. It's not through our willingness to learn. That's not where we find maturity, fullness, and understanding. We lack the comprehension of the eternal perspective because we've not spent time with him who is from eternity. We've not taken the time and effort to actually listen to him, to when we read the Bible to ask him, Lord, what is it that you're saying here? To look for his heart and to care about what he has to say. If we're not, if we're not reading our Bible to look for what God is actually saying, if, we're, if we are, maybe I'll put it the other way, if we are reading our Bible so that we can get blessing out of it and to see, oh wow, this verse is so comforting to me, then we're not actually taking the time to care about what God is actually saying. We're not taking the time to care what God is speaking, where His heart is. It's the whole way in which we understand, in which we read the Bible, it's the whole way in which we uh, word and relate to the Bible, that if the Bible itself is all pointing to Jesus, which specifically means Jesus dying on the cross so that we can be saved, if that's the way we see the Bible, it's no wonder then why it is we have so many people who don't understand. It's because we're not taking the time and effort to ask what is it that God is trying to point out here. We're not looking for His heart and His purposes, His mind. Instead, we're looking for our own. Ultimately, the eternal perspective is the comprehension of the eternal covenant and the way it is explained in both the Old and New Testament together together, <laughs> never opposed to one another. The eternal covenant, that which was made from the foundations, that when, when you read Revelation, you come into chapter 13 and you find a small verse and a phrase within that verse that calls Jesus the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. That before there was even the laying down of the foundations, before there was even the creation itself, there was somehow a lamb that was slain 
And if we cannot have that perspective because our theology gets in the way or because we, we simply don't understand it, we say we believe it but we don't understand we're not understanding the eternal covenant then. We're not understanding what it is that God has been speaking from the beginning because it's never changed. Reconciliation is the author of all theological understanding. Reconciliation, what do I mean by that? We reconcile what the Old and the New Testament say. We reconcile them together so we can understand one cohesive message. That it's not two different things where the New Testament God is different than the Old Testament God because now we have this Jesus Messiah, this buddy Jesus we can fist bump and think that we're cool with. There, there is a reconciling that needs to take place where we see that the heart of the Father in the Old Testament, that even in his chastisements, there's still mercy and love and that he's still crying out with that same compassion that Jesus would say, Oh, how I have longed to gather you like a hen would gather her chicks, but you were unwilling we can see the same heart there, the same God there, the same message, the same covenant, the same everything between Old and New Testament. There's a reconciling from God to, to man through Christ. There's reconciliation of one another in Christ, that the dividing wall of hostility between male and female, between slave and free, between Jew and Gentile, between all things, the racism and the, the sexism and everything that to, seems to divide us. Our denominational walls, our Catholic, Protestant, and Greek Orthodox, and everything else, it should be broken down because we should be reconciled to one another in Christ. If that's not what we're about, we're not, then we're not teaching the gospel. We're, we're supposed to be ministers of reconciliation. God has reconciled and is reconciling all things, and that means all things together in Christ under one head. That's in Ephesians 1. I want to say it's verse 6 or so. So, last slide for this little introduction. Prolegomena and Bibliology. These are the most elementary subjects of the whole of theology. It means a great deal for us to wrestle with them fully before moving onward into the next piece. And the reason is because if we don't wrestle these things, then when it comes up later and we haven't built that foundation, then we're going to have slippery discussions, and we're not going to understand one another. So this series is not the final word, but the beginning of the discussion. I'm currently writing these thoughts out as we go through this. I'm currently uh, wrestling with this. So your comments and thoughts are welcomed, your critiques, your agreements, everything. Feel free to put in your own two cents. Um, so with that... I guess we'll conclude the video. Thanks for listening. Um, hopefully you're looking forward to the rest of it.